AP Physics. Let's go. Let's talk about torque. There's different ways you can get at what is going to be our definition for torque, um, but uh, this is the way we're going to do it. <clears throat> so think about uh, Newton's first law. Second law, just kidding. Think about Newton's second law. You can think about the first law, but when you're done doing that, think about Newton's second law, which is <clears throat> force is equal to mass times acceleration. Now, that's a little bit loose because really it's the sum of all forces. So um, I'm just going to use this kind of loose version of it here to motivate um, how we are going to define torque. Now, um, if we want... to think about the rotational analogs of things, we already know what the rotational analog of mass is. It is rotational inertia. So that's like our rotational mass. And we have, uh, for acceleration, also we have angular acceleration. So if we want a version of Newton's second law but in rotational form, then um, this is what we would like to show up on this side, right? And then the question is, well, what then is the thing that has to be right here? And that is the thing that's going to be the rotational analog of force. Rotational analog of force, it's torque. Uh, that's what we're going to call it. Um, but I don't know what that's got to be equal to. I can't, it's not just force, right? Because that wouldn't be rotational force. So um, let's figure out what that needs to be there by messing with this. So let's see. I know if I want to get into rotational stuff, I know that this is equal to alpha times r. And then, if I want to get to this, I know the rotational inertia for like a particle, if we're imagining um, like breaking something up into a bunch of particles like we did for kinetic energy, then um, I know that the rotational inertia is mr squared. So if I multiply both sides by r, Then, and do a little rearranging, I've got mr squared times alpha. And if I do that, I've got to multiply both sides. Um, so there's my i, there's my alpha that I was looking for. And then this is torque. Uh, torque, we use a lowercase tau. Um, which is uh, like a pie with only one leg. So um, try not to make it just look like a T, because that looks like tension, and there's going to be tension in some torque problems, so that's really confusing. you got to try to um, make a small amount of artistic effort here, please. Um, so we're going to define... torque... is equal to tau, which is r. Um, I'm not going to get into it's really a cross product, but I don't want to get it. I don't want to go down that vector rabbit hole right now. So um, for right now, we're going to say it's force times radius. Now the thing is, if you think about a some object that is free to rotate on some axis, and there's a force being applied to it, let's say here, then um, it's not all of this force that's causing the rotation. If you think about that, what the, the part of this force, the component of this force that's causing the rotation is really this component right here, the component that's perpendicular to R. 
if this force, for example, was straight out like that, that would cause zero rotation. You'd just be like tugging on the axis, basically. Um, so this is the component that's getting it done. And, um, hmm, well, what component is that? It's the sine component of that. So unlike work, where we multiply by the cosine of the angle in between, because when you have work, the best, the most effect you're going to get is when the force is in exactly the same direction as the displacement. Whereas with torque, the most bang for your buck is when the force is perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So that's why we're seeing sine show up here instead of cosine. Um, so I think that's uh, all we need here. And this is the angle between F and R. And the good news here is it doesn't, you can just take the smaller version of the angle between them because the sine of an angle and the sine of its supplement are the same. So um, there's no confusion about the angle. You just need to find the angle between them. Or when you, when you talk about the angle between two vectors, by the way, if you're talking about the, uh, this is kind of an aside, you can include this in your notes or not. But uh, what is the angle, inch angle between uh, this vector, let's say A and this little vector b. The angle between them is if you imagine that those two vectors are the hands of a clock, this is the angle between them. It's not, but the nice thing for us anyway is that angle between them, which would correspond to like this right here in this picture, the sine of that angle is the same as the sine of this angle because those two angles are supplements and the sine of an angle and the sine of its supplement are equal. Fun fact. Um, so anyway, it doesn't matter uh, which angle you choose. So that's good news for us. We're going to be good. Um, and it is certainly, uh, just like with work, work is equal to force times distance times the cosine of the angle between them, it is very often the case that the force is in fact perpendicular to this and that means that you don't need that term. It is often the case, but not always. So. Watch out. So um, I think I'm going to do a quick example for you. And um, I couldn't really decide whether I wanted to do an example with numbers or just with symbols, um, you know, where I don't have any numbers. Um, so hmm, let's go ahead and do one just with symbols. So let's say I have a disc here. This is a pulley. Um, I'm going to tell you that it's a uniformly um, distributed disc. What does that mean? It means that its rotational inertia is equal to its mass times the radius squared. So let's say it has a radius r. And um, on this disk of mass M hangs two blocks. One of mass 2M and the other of mass M, which happens to be the same mass as the pulley. Okay, so uh, let's try to find the acceleration of this. Now, we did problems like this back in chapter five or six, I don't remember exactly which, or maybe both. And um, we always treated pulleys like they were frictionless and massless. We're still going to go with frictionless, but we're not going to pretend that this has no mass anymore. So um, if you want to think about it in terms of energy, you can take an energy approach to this, or you can take a forces and torques approach. I'm going to do the forces and torques for you here. But, um, this, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the pulley disk does not rotate for free. That costs some energy. And we know about that now. Rotational kinetic energy is one half 
um, I omega squared. So that is going to suck up some of the energy of the system, which means the acceleration should be less than uh, what we would get if we just assumed that it was a massless pulley. So um, let's see what we need to do here. So back in the day in chapters 5 and 6, what we would have done, we would have made a Newton's second law equation, like force diagram and equation for this block, and we would have made one for this block, and then we would have ended up with a system of equations. That's all great. We're going to do the same thing, but now I have to also make a Newton's, a Newton's second law in rotational form equation and diagram for the pulley. Doesn't really matter what order you do them in, but that's what makes sense to me to lay them out that way. Okay, so when we release things, this is going to accelerate downward, and this is going to accelerate upward. So um, what's winning on this? The force of gravity, which is 2mg, and then the tension here. Now, the tension here is not going to be the same as the tension here. And if you're like, well, how about you know that? Well, it can't be. Um, if, there is, if this thing is going to start rotating, that means there is some net torque on it. It's going to experience angular acceleration. And since uh, Newton's second law, sum of all torques is equal to I alpha, uh, that's Newton's second law in rotational form, um, if this is not zero, then that can't be zero. So there must be more torque in this direction than there is in this direction. So T1 and this other tension over here cannot be equal to each other. So uh, I'm going to have to call them T1 and T2. So Newton's second law here, sum of all forces equal to uh, 2mg minus T1. And the, this is mass times acceleration, right? So mass of this block is 2m. OK, so that's where we end up with that. Now with the pulley, I've got the two tensions, T1 here and T2 here. Now they're both acting at radius r from that, which is nice for us. So um, the torque from this one, I'm going to call this the positive direction because that's the direction things are accelerating in. Um, and so this tension is winning, that torque is winning. So let's call that torque 1 minus this torque is trying to get it to go the other way. So that's just like these are opposing each other. These torques are opposing each other. So if this is the positive direction, this is the negative direction. So T1 minus T2 is equal to, oh, I'm doing this the backwards. Sorry, I should have put that on the other side if I wanted to be consistent with how I'm doing these. That's the sum of all torques. And the sum of all torques is equal to I alpha because Newton's second law in rotational form. And torque 1 is T1 times R minus torque 2 is T2 times R. And I don't know why. I guess just because we're used to doing this with forces, it is so common for me to see physics students such as yourselves accidentally leave these R's off. You can't, torques are not, uh, sorry, forces are not torques. It has to be a force times a radius. Notice that the sign is not there because they're at 90 degrees. Um, OK, what's the rotational inertia of this disk? Oh, I said it was. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Of course, a disk is 1 half mr squared, not mr squared. Jeez, McGrath. So uh, this is 1 half mr squared. And then alpha is equal to A over R acceleration over r. And you need to make that substitution if you want to be able to talk to these equations. And then I got a t1 minus t2 times r. So if you look at what happens with all the r's, 
one cancels here, and then there's an R on this side and an R on that side, so those also cancel. And this simplifies to 1 half M A equals T1 minus T2. And if you're thinking like, oh, I'm going to multiply that through by 2 so I don't have any fractions, hold on, cool your jets for a second here. Um, so for the other mass, I've got, uh, this one is accelerating up, so T1 is winning versus mg. So here I have uh, T1, uh, sum of all forces equals T1 minus mg, and this is mass times acceleration because the mass of this block is just one of those m's equals uh, t1 minus mg. Okay, now here's the really cool thing, and it's going to happen every single time, not just especially because I set this problem up in any particular way. Um, if you add these three equations together, look what happens. This one has a minus t1 on the right. This one has a positive t1 on the right. This one has a negative t2 on the right. And this one has a positive t2. Sorry. On the right. So when you add them all together, all three equations, all of the tensions cancel out. So um, let's do that. So here I've got 2 ma, a half an ma, and 1 ma. So that's what, 3 and a half? And then here I've got 2 mg. Tension cancels out, tensions cancel out, tension cancels out. So I just have 2 mg minus mg. And the m's cancel out. That's the same as 7 over 2. So there's my acceleration. How about that? Um, that might seem like a horrible, uh, complicated mess, but you'll get used to that. Um, I, I don't know why. I really like problems. Like this, I guess I like the elegance of the math, the way that the um, the tension always cancels out, and of course it has to. It's really just like a Newton's third law thing. If the tension is up on this, then that same tension has to be down on this, and then if the tension too is uh, down on this, it has to be up on this one. So it it all has to uh, work out that way. All right, um, that's your torque notes. Um, have fun with that and try those problems in the book. Time's up.